In one of your Telegram posts, you mentioned that you have had six different teachers in four different places. Five IELTS stars that, you know, we, we really have no doubt about their credentials. Like uh, People say, oh, I have finished all these Cambridge books, like, uh, but I'm still getting no more than 30. <laughs> What's your take on that? Don't get obsessed with practice tests. Mm. There is nothing I recommend uh, to my students more than reading books. Hmm. You have to be a book lover, right? Style, I don't like doing full practice tests hmm. for some reason. What are your suggestions to improve task one? The first advice I give to all IELTS students is just decide when you will take IELTS and what score you're aiming at. I had that experience one time. <laughs> uh, some student came to our center and they said, well, my level is now this and I need a 7.5 next month. <laughs> so I was like, well, this person doesn't need a teacher, they need a Santa Claus, right? <laughs> so don't check your social media accounts as soon as you open your eyes. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't misinterpret my <laughs> suggestion. Uh, like, reading books is great, okay? But there are certain things I would like people to understand. Mm -hmm. Reading books by itself doesn't make you a better person. Knowledge is only useful when you put it into practice. Sufyan al-Thawri, he has a great saying, right? That uh, knowledge in combination, like knowledge and action should go hand in hand. Yeah. And speaking of again books, what's your most favorite uh, book or three books in English language that you would recommend to people that they read? And that was uh, probably the lowest moment in my life. I clearly remember that. The moment I started learning English, uh, my life changed entirely. If you want to start improving your life, I would recommend uh, that you stop ruining it, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of wasting your time, you know, in terms of hanging out with bad company, because company also plays a, a, a big part. Always be thankful for your life, and secondly, appreciate your family while they are still around. I definitely recommend checking out uh, Jordan Peterson. Speaking of resources, like, is there any particular book that you would like to recommend to practice and learn task one? And uh, also, like, speaking of channels, right, you, like teachers, you said, is there any teachers that you would recommend, like, I mean, on YouTube, that you recommend him as a reliable person to follow? If you have a couple of months, at least, for preparation, then work up your psyche to the point where you want to get nine. Yeah. Don't settle for anything less than eight. Hmm. in the listening section because it's very easy, right? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Azad Beg, hoş geldiniz. Ben Allah kolsa bugün tak avlan bor taklif qilgan da rad etmagan shu rahmat. Siz bizga taklif qilish bilan maqsad to'g'risi siz yoshingizda bu narsalarga men ko'p alig'ini nima deydi? To'g'risi hech kim bilan maqtashmas. Misol, bu narsalarni men ko'p bilgan, siz qilgan ishlarni bilmagandim. Misol, arab tilida mana Hozir o'z o'zingizga aytib bersangiz kerak, o'sha C1 darajasi yoki IELTS 8.5 darajasi bu haqiqatda havas qiladigan natijalar va har xil konferensiyalar, bir Telegram kanallaringizni ko'rib chiqdim, YouTube videolarini ancha-muncha narsalarda qatnashib, ommaviylik juda yaxshi ekan. Shuning uchun keling o'zingiz ozgina qisqa tanishtirib bering, misol kuzatayotganligi va undan so'ng xudo xolasa har xil mavzular bo'yicha boshlaymiz. So let's start. Like I think if we keep the conversation in English maybe it would be better. I almost forgot that we should switch. And just yeah, please uh, give us a brief introduction about yourself. All right. Uh, well, assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Now, uh, my name is Ozatbek Batraliyev and I'm a third year student at International Islamic Academy of Uzbekistan. I'm originally from Andijan and um, I started learning English in 2014 and since then I've been in this sector like learning and teaching IELTS and English uh, mm -hmm. in general and this is briefly about myself. Good, thank you. I mean, let's, uh, because most people watch this interview probably because of your IELTS and they want to get some insight into language learning. So uh, I would like to start off by some questions. And by the way, he doesn't know what kind of questions I will be asking. So uh, to make this conversation as natural as possible. So let's start then. I know that you're, you know, uh, let's say, C1 Arabic speaker and in one of your telegram posts you mentioned that you have had six different teachers in four different places why is that like I mean what was the issue that you had to switch so many times let's say the teacher or the center all right uh, this is a very good question 
in terms of learning Arabic, I think uh, we have huge issues because, mm. uh, well, it's a large, broad topic. I think that it has to do with lack of resources first and foremost. And, uh, you know, when it comes to the approach of studying a language, not mm. just Arabic, but mm. generally speaking, there is too much emphasis on the wrong things, in yeah. my opinion. <laughs> exactly. Right? So you have students who are studying English, for example, for years, yet they can't string a sentence together correctly, <laughs> all right? Or uh, they learned lots of vocabulary, but they can't use it. Yeah. And this was the case with my journey to Arabic. I would go to different teachers and they would be learning stuff which is not used at all. Mm. Okay? And that was the problem. Like, I didn't want to learn lots of grammar. I didn't want to learn lots of morphology mm. before I learned the basics, Yeah. right? So you have, for example, students who've been studying for almost three, four, three to four years, but if you ask them how old they are, mm. they can't say that in <laughs> Arabic. It's, yeah, it is mesmerizing. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, we have the same issue, right? Sometimes we see in regions, especially like I, I come actually myself from Namangan, and I look at the teachers and the students, they, you know, they come up to me sometimes that I need to prepare for IELTS. And when I ask them, let's say some sort of like some questions, they can't answer. They have been just learning grammar. <laughs> That's an issue, right? Because grammar is just one aspect of it. What do you think? What do you take? I mean, what's your take on that? And how can we improve the situation like, you know, in Uzbekistan to make the language process, let's say, authentic, more natural? Well, definitely, this is the problem we have since, uh, I think for the past couple of decades, entrance exams to universities were only focused or they were obsessed with grammar, yeah. doing tests. And that kind of trickled down from generation to generation, you know? So for example, the teachers of our teachers were uh, very conscious about teaching gra certain grammar rules to their students, which now are almost out of date, like they are not used at all. So for example, past perfect tense yeah. or future perfect tenses, yeah. uh, like future perfect continuous. Yes, maybe in some obscure situation, you will need this when yeah. you are reading a book. But generally speaking, when a student just starts to learn a language, you don't start with, you know, different grammar rules, right? You take it easy. Uh, teach him how to say hello, teach him how to say how are you, right? Yeah. Start with the basics, learn the high frequency vocabulary. Yeah. And then, yes, maybe when he gets to an advanced level, then you turn your attention to more complex topics. You know? Yeah. Good advice. I think that we all the teachers right around Uzbekistan should switch to teaching general English instead of just grammar translation method. And it would be, um, I think, better. I mean, it would be great. <laughs> and, you know, I have read actually one interesting statistics and I want to know your opinion on that. Um, the thing is that the government on a like, yearly basis spends so much money for the salaries of English language teachers. And yet, we don't see, uh, I mean, many people, I mean, many, let's say, students who study at school and who master the English language. Majority of them, if not all of them, go to the private centers and study English. And if that's the case, why, I mean, let's say, waste so much money on the salaries? Why don't they, I mean, why don't we switch? What is your, like, is it better maybe to somehow to reform the school teaching or should we, like, just drop it and spend that money, like, billions of money just to something useful? Do you have the exact statistics? Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I have, like, a, let's say, a colleague who he works like in this like uh, linguistic effect. And he says that, I mean, you know, just a typical uh, English teacher, like what do you think how much they make? I think it's about minimum three million, two million, right? And the thing is that, and imagine we have like tens of thousands of teachers, like if not like hundreds of thousands of teachers. And the thing is that he was telling me like as a friend, hey, like, I mean, look at it. Like government is trying so hard, it's pushing so hard, but still, people are not learning English there. Like, what's the point of trying so hard? Instead, let this, I mean, let them work, right? I mean, like, the, let this money spent on, like, private centers, let them learn a uh, good language. Like, so we could use this money maybe to a better purpose. Well, if you compare state education with private centers, I think that 
there is a world of difference. Uh, to my mind, the major problem with uh, schools and, and universities as a whole is that you have all sorts of students mixed up in the same group mm -hmm. and they have the same curriculum, which is not uh, customized. Mm. You know, individuals have different needs and uh, when you have a private center teaching a group of 12 students and then you have a school where you have 40 students in a group, all of whom not only have different preferences when it comes to learning, but they have different levels of dedication and different levels of you know, uh, commitment to learning English, then of course, naturally, lots of problems are going to arise. If you ask me, I don't think we should ditch teaching English uh -huh. uh, at altogether school? yeah. at schools. But we, we should, yes, we should definitely have some kind of reform, okay, mm -hmm. where th there should be some kind of result. Yeah. A student who is learning English since class one for mm -hmm. 11 years spends <laughs> some time, like a, a significant amount of time on this subject, should have some kind of results. They yeah. should not come out as zeros. Yeah. And it's a complex issue, right? There's an involvement of like young people, as you said, many people study. This is another problem, like, like unlike private education centers, they just don't have the opportunity to hire many teachers and stuff like that. Good. And like speaking of this language learning, I mean, as a, someone who mastered two lang foreign languages minimum, like I, as far as I know, you know, uh, fluently Arabic and English, probably Russian as well. What are the three suggestions you can suggest to young people who are on the right end edge of learning language? Like what things they should do consistently uh, so that they can enjoy the process and as well maybe learn the language in a natural way? All right, well, thank you for the question. I think you already mentioned two of my principles uh, <laughs> in your question, right? Uh, the first of which was consistency and yeah. the second of which was fun, you know? Yeah. Uh, in terms of learning a language, uh, I feel like it should be a fun process, mm -hmm. right? You should not be dreadful, like uh, you should not be scared of yeah. your textbooks, right? Exactly. And uh, to facilitate fun, like to, to make learning into, uh, into a fun process, uh, I definitely recommend students to, for example, try out cartoons, right? Mm. Or soap operas. Uh, if you ask me, I watched lots of uh, cartoons, right? Uh, when I was learning Arabic, it was uh, I think Avatar and, and Bakugan and, and uh, other yeah, such I cartoons. saw some of their names actually while scrolling through your channel and I was making questions and I was like, wow, because, great. Like human beings are, uh, they are by nature very weak, uh, achieve, like they are not great performance, they are mm. procrastinators, right? Yeah. So when you have your book, uh, say Destination or, or Reading Challenge, uh, which you have to complete, you don't have the motivation to open up that book. <laughs> However, when it's your favorite movie or when it's your favorite soap opera, which you're cramming to watch, you know, it it's a game changer because, uh, you know, we would watch these cartoons back to back. Yeah, it's a dopamine effect, right? It gives that and you just want it more, right? So it looks like you are addicted to them. And it's good because input is the key, right? Input yeah. is the key. And of course, consistency is also very important. It's much better to have a 30 minute time you allocate for studying on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of pulling all nighters once a week, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you need to have, because I mean, look at training. Sports people don't train once uh, a week, right? Yeah. They have a daily regimen uh, every day. So consistency is also very important. And third thing I would recommend is, and I think we're gonna like it, is to go to a teacher, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so it's so if, important. If you have a good teacher, they can definitely ease the process. They can make your journey uh, very smooth because they've been through this, right? Yeah. In terms of advice, guidance, and also uh, they will make sure you're not stepping on the wrong path, right? Yes. You're not going somewhere wrong. Uh, whether it's learning the wrong tenses or whether it's taking up the wrong sources, right? So these three, uh, make sure there is fun in your mm -hmm. learning, make sure it's consistent, 
and make sure you have a good teacher. So follow it, guys. <laughs> Don't forget. Yeah, I think I also tell like sometimes when we do this voice chat and talks, people tell me like, I mean, it's not because I want them to be my students and come to me. I just tell them, hey, like wherever you live, find a good teacher because teacher knows it. I mean, teacher, as you had, has been uh, through that journey and he, he knows the ups and downs and he will, I mean, it's a kind of investment probably in your future, right? You, in, you save a lot of time. It is possible. It's not like we say, or we are saying impossible to prepare by yourself or IELTS, whatever, but it takes so much effort, so much waste of time. And, and we know that time is the most important asset in our life and we lose it. I mean, that's terrible. So speaking of this, you know, like language learning, I mean, we know that social media has also like played some sort of role in language. Like, I mean, as you said, you watch soap opera and there are a lot of people also who watch, who follow some content and channels on YouTube, Instagram, Telegram. What is your take on that? I mean, are there like, I mean, the, like IELTS question, you know, do the advantages of this phenomenon outweigh the disadvantages or do you think it's a, you know, like, I don't know, use of waste of time? Well, uh... I think that there is a lot of goodness uh, in uh, whoever is teaching something online, uh, but there is just one caveat. You mm. have to follow a credible teacher, right? Mm. So the person you're following on social media, on YouTube, has to know his audience, right? Uh, oh. And that's why like, we made a post recently, five IELTS stars that, you know, we, we really have no doubt about their credentials. Like, uh, Paul and Colin, for example, mm -hmm. uh, who's actually been involved in the IELTS uh, sphere for decades. Yeah. She's not only prepared tests herself, she's also a teacher, an examiner, right? But, uh, okay, I, I know some, some, some people don't like following Uzbek IELTS teachers, mm. but they know our uh, ways and fails better than the, the English mm. or anyone who is you know, teaching abroad. So I think that, yes, follow the inter in international teachers and follow your local teachers, but don't get uh, picky, like some people follow everybody. Yeah, <laughs> true. If I, you look at their Telegram accounts, they have hundreds <laughs> of channels. I used to have such channels, but now I just uh, have a, just a handful of channels uh, because uh, most of them, you know, are actually run by people who have no uh, less certificate in IELTS for teaching, like, I mean, you know, that young people. The but problem with that is that uh, when you have one IELTS expert suggesting something, suggesting A, and the other uh, IELTS expert suggesting B, then the student is confused. Yeah. Uh, I have some of my students tell me, well, you're saying this, but I heard this person say <laughs> X. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, <laughs> it's their method, and this is my method, yeah. take it or leave it. Right. Yeah, so don't follow everybody, follow credible teachers. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, I would suggest everyone because I remember back in 2019, I was going to prepare, start my second, I mean, preparation for the second time. And in my computer, I had collected like hundreds of books and like materials, videos. And I mean, it's just if you think so possible, there's no time to finish all of it. Like it's just even lifetime will not be enough. So I decided actually this Pauline Collins Key to a Success book, I read it and I came to realize that we need to just uh, right, focus on just a few reliable sources or teachers and just finish it. Like uh, people say, oh, I have finished all these Cambridge books, like, uh, but I am still getting no more than 30. <laughs> What's your take on that? Why people practice, focus so much, right? And what is, why do you think it's happening? Like some students, right, candidates, maybe there are some of them, like practice it all of the Cambridge, but still nowhere near that band seven. Okay, uh, practice tests are another uh, topic which is causing a lot of headache. Uh, if you ask me, I haven't finished all the Cambridge tests. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I have not. Now as a teacher, I'm using them more often, but as a student, I, I, I did not even know there were Cambridge tests, mm -hmm. frankly. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and I think it was a mistake because Cambridge practice tests are the most reliable, the most authentic source of practice tests. Okay. Uh, however, my advice to students in particular would be, again, don't get obsessed with practice tests. Uh, there is a beautiful saying, if you keep counting from 1 to 10, you're not going to learn 11, right? Yeah. So, practice tests don't necessarily 
increase your knowledge. They don't necessarily add to your proficiency of English, right? Uh, but they are a good way of, for example, checking your progress, mm. uh, right? So my recommendation is if you do decide to do practice tests, then you need to approach it thoroughly. Like, okay, it's not like you do one reading passage, you check your answers and you move on to the second reading passage. No. Uh, resolve, for example, this reading passage, analyze your mistakes. Definitely you should know where you're getting the answers. You mm. should not be getting A, B out of thin air, yeah. right? It should not be a guess. Exactly. And then the vocabulary as well. When it comes to vocabulary as well, you don't learn all the new words you, you get in the reading passage, but you should learn the words which are impeding communication, right? Words mm. which are not letting you find the right answers. So if you do approach uh, practice tests, make sure you do, th you do them wisely. That mm. would be my recommendation. Great advice. And uh, I know that you have that perfect nine in listening, I mean, receptive skills. Uh, rating, I mean, at least, like, I mean, it's really high, even like 8.59. And I just want to know your thoughts. Uh, as you said, every teacher has a certain way of teaching it, but I mean, we all have some similarities. And if you could uh, give to a student like three habits that they should develop right before ex exam to prepare on a daily basis, what three things would you suggest, for example, for listening to make that high result, I mean, perfect result happen? And the same thing with the reading. Okay, uh, so let's start with listening. Uh, listening is the easiest section, and that's what mm -hmm. you need to understand. If you have a couple of months at least for preparation, then work up your psyche to the point where you want to get nine. Yeah. Don't settle for anything less than eight mm -hmm. in the listening section because it's very easy, right? Yeah. Uh, as far as habits are concerned, then definitely we would recommend listening <coughs> to lots of English, authentic uh, English, right? It could be podcasts, it could be watching news, it could be uh, anything where visual aids are not involved. Uh -huh. So first thing is to listen to as much as English as possible without visual aids. Second thing, to listen to as much English as possible with visual aids, hmm. okay? So, so it's movies, huh. uh, again, uh, soap operas, documentaries, because visual aids, uh, visual aids, they help to uh, facilitate understanding. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you can understand from the context what's happening, more or less, right? And the third thing uh, here is practice tests. Like I said, you, you can't do without practice tests. Mm. Listening strategies <laughs> is yeah. a very good book yeah, uh, yeah. to improve your listening, right? So these three things for listening. And almost the same advice for reading. Mm. There is nothing I recommend uh, to my students more than reading books. Hmm. You have to be a book lover, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and it's a statistic. As a teacher, based on my teaching experience, uh, I have seen students who love reading, I mean, in real life, tend to get higher results than <laughs> in IELTS reading. I mean, I don't know, they maybe have this habit of understanding the reading text better. But uh, we know that IELTS reading is an academic reading. So what else would you recommend apart from just reading books? Because they have to also get right uh, comfortable with the format because it could be quite different uh, in the test. Definitely. Well, so reading a book is just one uh, of my many recommendations, right? Uh, practice tests. <laughs> so we're going to keep coming to practice <laughs> yeah. tests, right? But not... Uh, I mean, I don't know, this is my personal uh, style. I don't like doing full practice tests mm. for some reason uh, because they could be a, a lot of headache, right? They, are, they will sap you of your energy, to be frank, right? So one, if you're studying on your own, for example, do one reading passage daily, one reading passage daily, consistently, right? With analysis, with learning of the new words, right? Uh, definitely analyzing your answers, uh, things that went wrong and things be, that didn't go wrong, right? Uh, so these two, and then the third thing is you need to understand, you need to learn the format as well. Yeah. So for example, in the reading question, uh, in the reading section, how many question types do you have? How many of them come in order, right? Mm. Uh, when you're filling the answers, one word, two words, right? Is a book one word or is it two words? Is state of the art one word or is it four words, yeah. right? So understanding the format is also going to help, right? And with some effort, uh, it's going to improve. Yeah, I think uh, we should write, as you have mentioned, follow these tips and be patient because 
a reading takes definitely more time to make progress. And now moving on to like, let's finish with IELTS and then we move on to other topics. I mean, writing, right? It's a pain in the neck for many people. <laughs> it's a headache. So, I mean, and I actually myself, to be honest, personally uh, hated writing a lot and I didn't practice it that much. And that was the reason that I got a, let's say, a 6.5 result. And I'm not, let's say, I don't shy away from that. And I'm ho hopefully in my next attempt, I'm, I'm hoping to make that 7 plus. Uh, so the thing with task one, let's start with task one. I mean, it's something different, right, to young people. Like there are graphs and people who have never seen this and or like or really terrible at math. They look, it looks scary to them. And what are your suggestions to improve task one? All right. So task one, uh, yeah, is scary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, luckily, mm -hmm. writing section as a whole, uh, it doesn't usually make up uh, a huge share of your overall score, right? Even uh, even if you do get a low score, then you still have chances of getting a higher band overall. When it comes to task one, I think that you need to take it very easy. So you start simple. Uh, you need to understand that all of these charts, they can generally be divided into two, graphs with trends and graphs without trends, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't really matter if it's a table, if it's a bar chart. So if you have just one time scale, then it's a graph without trends, without changes. Yeah. If, if it does have more than one time scale, already it's graphs with uh, trends, right? And from there you start learning, you know, how to approach these questions. You don't memorize chunks. Memorize the chunks are very dangerous because, uh, I mean, the examiners, they have a section for penalty. Yeah. It's called memorized, right? So if it's a graph with trends, then you describe changes. Uh, upward trend, downward trend, increases, decreases, uh, fluctuations, remaining uh, stable, etc. Right? If it's a graph without trends, then you just make comparisons. This was the largest figure, this was the uh, uh, smallest figure, right? So here I think that if you have a good teacher, it should not be a problem because they will handle these topics yeah. very, uh, very skillful. If you don't, you can still uh, find lots of useful resources on YouTube as well, right? Just Again, yes, your advice, be patient. <laughs> Rome wasn't built overnight. Just, uh, just believe in yourself, okay? This is the best <laughs> advice I can give. It's gonna come with enough practice, with enough learning, right? Uh, you take it bit by bit. You yeah. take it bit by bit. Like the African proverb goes, if you wanna eat an elephant, you need to cut it up into pieces because you can't yeah. consume the whole elephant. You need to cut it up into yeah. pieces. You can say it again. And speaking of resources, like is there any particular book that you would like to recommend to practice and learn task one? And uh, also like speaking of channels, right? You, like teachers, you said, is there any teachers that you would recommend, like, I mean, on YouTube that you recommend him as a reliable person to follow? Well, I think that uh, one of the most popular teachers we have is Simon, mm -hmm. uh, whose uh, lessons are available on YouTube and also on his website. His essays are second to none, right? They are very, mm -hmm. very easy to follow. Uh, so you could use his uh, sources like as model answers, mm -hmm. but then there is, I think, a book called IELTS Journal for mm -hmm. task one, particularly uh -huh. helpful. Yeah, there's a good and one. And Paul and Colin's books for writing are second to none. Again, they are just out of this world. Mm -hmm. Very, very helpful uh, source, right? Uh, the key to IELTS writing? Yeah, or? task one and task two. Like I actually have recently bought it. I mean, they didn't start it yet, but I mean, just took, uh, take a look at the first lesson and it was, she was explaining everything in a just concise, clear way. And it was, uh, I start to finally. She spoon feed, like she, yeah. she will spoon feed task one to you, right? Exactly. And speaking of now, moving on to a more, much more important task, right? We know task two. Uh, it is hard, uh, I mean, for a certain number of reasons, like idea, idea development, just uh, this, and writing in general, understanding questions. So the same thing is again, how can we improve task to writing? And is there a book that you'd like to recommend? If there's not a book like, or what teachers, what do you suggest to improve our task to writing? So when it comes to task two, uh, there are a couple of things uh, I will recommend. First of all, it starts with understanding the test format, right? Uh, it a lot of things boil down to the marking criteria, for example, right? So imagine you are going to a shop 
if you don't know what you're gonna buy, how are you gonna buy that? Yeah. Right? You, you don't have mm -hmm. a shopping. Uh, and in the same like in the same way, imagine your mom tells you to go buy uh, some bananas, right? Yeah. Your bananas should be tasty. They should be fresh, affordable, right? Yeah. So you go to the marketplace and you go uh, and, and you buy fresh, tasty, affordable apples, <laughs> right? Even though they are both fresh and they are both not very expensive, they are both very tasty. Apples are not bananas. Yeah, right? exactly. So because of that, you have many, many students who think their English is good. And to be honest, their English is good. Yeah. I check their essays. Writing is my, like, it's my specialty, right? Mm. I run lots of writing courses and I see students with great English, sometimes as good as mine. Mm. They just don't get the question. Yeah. Look, this was an advantage, disadvantage question, which asked for your opinion. You didn't give your opinion. Your task response goes down badly, right? Yeah. So this was a problem effect, right? Problem effect question. You wrote a problem solution answer. Yeah, yeah. Your task response goes down badly. Right? Exactly. So you have to make sure you understand the marking criteria, like in terms of GRA, for example, and it's a very detailed discussion, but even if you wrote an essay without a single mistake, your GRA would not go up uh, higher than five, so let's say. Why? Mm. Because all of your sentences are very basic, simple. Mm. You're not using any complex structures. You're not mm. using any compound statements, sentences, right? Yeah. So uh, that's why understanding the test format comes at the top, then practicing a lot with feedback. If possible, yeah, okay, if you can't afford to go to a tutor, then that's another story. But if you do have a teacher definitely writing essays, and getting feedback on yeah. those essays is gonna help. And lastly, reading. Okay, uh, read a book, uh, read journals. Again, we come back to that advice, yeah? Reading is so helpful in so many ways, yes. right? How did we learn to speak as toddlers? Yeah. We learned speaking, you know, by listening to our elders. Yeah. How do we learn writing? By yeah. reading yeah. our elders, exactly. right? Someone who's a professional. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, this task to thing, uh, and I believe there's a tendency among like many young learners to, you know, focus on uh, vocabulary and like high level vocabulary, so call it, and so, so call it complex grammar. Because as, when I say complex grammar, they immediately think of long, very difficult to follow sentences. And I think that uh, could be, and they focus too much, and as you said, they just completely forget about the task achievement or task response criteria or the coherence and cohesion. And as you said, if you look at the assignments or Pauline Collins essays, they are so easy to follow, right? And speaking of practice, you have mentioned like how often, uh, let's say, a candidate, right, does an IELTS candidate should practice like writing? Should they just practice maybe once a week or more or less? What's your take on that? It goes back to uh, the score you're aiming at, okay? If you're an average student who's gonna be fine with, uh, let's say, an overall band 7, then writing is really not that important, uh, as opposed to listening and reading sections, for example. But if you're a teacher, right, who wants to up their IELTS score, mm. then writing could become the game changer, right? Yeah, yeah. So, me personally, when I was preparing for IELTS for the second time, I would write a couple of essays in the mornings daily, right? Mm. And a couple of essays is not a joke, right? Yeah, Many yeah. people won't even write one essay yeah, in yeah. a day, right? Sure. So if you need a greater overall band, then definitely you need to focus on writing. Even if you just write one task one a day and one task two the other day, right? Uh, so you have a couple of essays and a couple of reports in a week. Uh, if you are someone who will be fine with a 5.5, 6, right? So for example, uh, you have college applicants who are graduating schools. Then yes, there is no need to focus on writing since uh, you're not gonna get a high score on this section anyhow. Good, and very good advice, I like it. And I mean, I actually, as a teacher, I, I tell the same thing to my students. Like if you're aiming just seven, guys, there's this thing. It's not like a secret here, like uh, we are like discovering America. Get a very good result from listening and reading. It will bump up your overall score. 
and uh, it's just easy, much easier. It takes much less time, much less. It's not, we're not saying like listening and reading, it's easy. We're saying it's easier and takes less time to write, to improve it. And speaking of now, the final section on speaking, I mean, uh, some people find it quite great. I mean, enjoyable, this process. Like, but some people who, I don't know, from their family background, who are inborn, like, in, let's say, introvert, right, naturally shy, it's hard for them to speak to someone who has never seen them before. Like, but, like, I mean, I have seen my students talk to each other very openly, great, fluently. But then when I do a mock test, it's just a completely different person now. So what do you recommend for, in general, for speaking and for people like this who struggle to speak to someone, right, for the first time? All right, uh, so to improve your speaking, once again, I recommend what, watching lots of English, right, uh, to really build up your vocabulary for the speaking test, because uh, natural English is going to be different from the English you, you would write, for example, in your task too, right? So you have phrasal verbs, uh, and then uh, you have informal vocabulary, right? Kids is a great yeah. word for speaking, but is it a good word for writing, right? Uh, and then my one recommendation, which I think many people are negligent of, is to switch to English in your daily conversation, mm. right? Yeah. So don't limit your usage of English just to the classrooms. No, English has to become your default language outside of classrooms as well. To the point where even your dreams are in English. Yeah. So you go to sleep <laughs> <laughs> and your practice continues there, right? Uh, yeah, in your yeah. dreams. Because when you just do the practice tests, the questions are pretty narrow and limited. Mm. However, outside of classrooms, we have many more complex ideas, right? Yeah. Thoughts which are abstract. And if you try to, you know, express them in English, already that's a struggle. And of course, struggle, it leads to results. It leads to better results uh, after that, right? Yeah. Uh, but in terms of confidence, look, I'm not a psychology expert, right? I'm not sure how <laughs> not you Not Jordan could, Peterson. <laughs> exactly, how you could boost uh, your confidence. But uh, in my own case, we would, I mean, we were public speakers back in Andesan, yeah. we would have debates uh, and public speaking contests. I think that kind of helped, but uh, once again, this is not uh, an area of my expertise. <laughs> <laughs> Were you always that extroverted person or uh, was it like, uh, as there was a point that something shifted, right, in your personality that you, you decided to speak more and become extroverted? Well, it's hard to tell now, but <laughs> <laughs> back, uh, since I got my IELTS certificate, I've been uh, pretty much, uh, like, I've participated in lots of conferences and competitions where I had to speak in mm. front of the public, right? And uh, fear of public speaking, I think uh, it's uh, well known mm -hmm. among yeah. people. Yeah, some yeah. people I, I, read, I even read statistics that some people are more scared of public speaking than spiders, right? <laughs> How is that even possible, yeah. right? So you have to push yourself. It's like everything you want. There is a quote, beautiful quote. Let me just say, it. everything you want is on the other side of fear, right? Uh, so if you're bashful, yeah. if you're feeling diffident, like if you're experiencing lack of confidence, then the only way you can improve that is to just uh, face up to your inhibitions hmm. and start speaking, right? Yeah, it's not rocket science. Exactly. And uh, just one last thing, I think, on speaking. Uh, we know that some students like to learn so many idioms and idiomatic expressions, thinking that they will uh, can improve magically their sort of speaking result. And they, and I mean, if you actually listen to their answers, they sound pretty off topic or like, I mean, just really hard to follow, right? What is the best way to get a, let's say, uh, I mean, for most people, it's a seven in speaking, but what is the best way to improve speaking and speak in a real exam? All right, uh, so let's just focus first of all on idiomatic expressions uh, because I think you mentioned that in passing some students are obsessed with using particular vocabulary in the writing and speaking sections thinking that somehow their band is going to go up and that's not true because your speaking as well as your writing is uh, assessed you know, holistically yeah. not based on individual phrases yes, they do play a part but you know, using one or two fancy schmancy terms in your essay, you know, against the, your 
incohesive and very unclear writing <laughs> as a whole, it's not gonna do any good, right? Yeah. And the same can be said for speaking. Me, I think that I have personal experience with idioms. Uh, in my last <laughs> speaking exam, I used so many of them, uh, right? Uh, so hustle and bustle, mm. backwater, and uh, lots of other phrases like over the moon. Mm. Look, they are great yeah. if you can find the right context. Yeah, if you can use it in the right time, in the right place, right? But if you're forcing yeah. that vocabulary where it's not uh, appropriate, you know, it's gonna backfire. Yeah. And uh, from my understanding, and this is what I learned talking to uh, IELTS experts who got nine in the speaking section, yeah. idiomatic expressions are not confined to just uh, words like hit the books, you know, or uh, pull an all-nighter mm. and things of that sort. But the way you sound natural, anything that sounds natural mm. is considered an idiomatic expression, right? Yeah. So kind of phrases like, of course, it's not like, all of this will improve your speaking. Just make sure you use them in the right context and don't be obsessed with using particular vocabulary. Work on your overall speech, your pronunciation, right? If yeah. you're mispronouncing basic words like great, some people say yeah. great, yeah. or the word instead, again, instead, you know, there is really no point in trying to cram advanced vocabulary. Exactly. You know, recently I have discovered one very common mistake and the way I was mispronouncing it. I mean, sometimes I steal some of the words I mispronounce and it's just because it's our not right first language. But the word very close, like a clause or a close, right? And I mean, I used to say all the time closes and I one day checked the Cambridge Dictionary and I was like really shocked that it ha it's not, there's no closes, it's just close and it's in singular version slots, clause. And I was like, wow. <laughs> that was eye-opening. <laughs> yeah, that was, I mean, I mean, we call it all fossilized errors and so many people, right, don't realize it. And uh, yeah, and as you said, like there is a pronunciation, grammar, fluency, uh, I mean a lot of other criteria in the speaking as well and the best way is to speak naturally. And here uh, I actually in one of your posts I again found out about the IELTS registration. You said the best students register now and the worst they register when they feel ready. Do you still think the same way? And if yes, why? Definitely yes. <laughs> Uh, the first advice I give to all IELTS students is just decide when you will take IELTS and what score you're aiming at. Mm -hmm. Because if you keep your goals foggy and vague, yeah. yes, maybe it doesn't look like, a, it doesn't feel like failing yeah. or falling down. Mm -hmm. It is falling down, right? Uh, and this is a quote from uh, Jordan Peterson, right? I'm, I'm, his, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, yeah, right? he, yeah, he speaks facts. <laughs> like there is a, a thing called the Parkinson law and it's, I think, beautiful. It says work expands to fill the time available for its completion. Mm -hmm. So if you need to clean up your room yeah. and if you have an hour to do that, yeah. You're gonna clean it in an hour. Yeah. If you give yourself two hours, you're yeah. gonna clean your room in two hours. Exactly. So optimal anxiety. You need to push yourself to where studying becomes a little bit challenging. Don't become complacent. When you tell yourself, I'm gonna take IELTS when I feel ready for it. And as someone who's been preparing for IELTS or who's been in this field for almost seven years now, you never, you never feel ready. Yeah, okay? yeah. You Completely. never feel ready. That's why it's always a good idea to give yourself a deadline, decide when you will take IELTS, right? I really, if I took IELTS three times, and I did take IELTS three times, <laughs> it never once did I tell myself, I'm gonna take IELTS when I feel ready. Mm. The first time I registered five months prior to the exam. Mm -hmm. And the next two times I gave myself two months time, which I think is pretty, uh, reasonable to give yourself a couple of months for preparation, right? So that you don't feel lax. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like your exam is never gonna come because mm -hmm. it's gonna come. Yeah. Right? So you better set up yourself, work up your psyche, and I think it's gonna improve your productivity levels by a lot. Yeah. I think, you know, that's the thing I have, I have, <laughs> let's see. Uh, but there's the other side I also think. For example, sometimes, you know, I agree with you, right? I mean, what all of you, what it has, but there is students 
who have no good knowledge of English and they register to the exam and they come up to me and they say, the teacher, I have an exam next month, so I need to prepare. And uh, you see, that if you just took, take a look at these students, right, it is a problem. And, uh, and I tell them, like, you know, yes, you need to write, I mean, prepare, register, but there should be also, like, I mean, that, I mean, yeah, you're totally right when you said you have to be clear in your mind when you're going to take it and what score you, you need it. Because oftentimes when you ask students, they want all of them 7 plus, if not 8 plus, but they, most of them, they don't need these scores. They just need, for example, for, to apply to our local universities, just 5.5 and or just 6 or 7 for master degree, and that's it. It's like it's our what we want and what we actually need are quite different. So what do you recommend to such people who like, you know, who have no knowledge, I mean, good knowledge of English, but they, you know, they first registered and then they try to prepare files, like. Oh, it's a good point. No, like, you don't become reckless about your exam. It costs a good sum of money, right? Uh, mm. You don't want to be retaking it over and over again. And that's why taking a mock IELTS test helps, you know, doing, uh, analyzing your level comes first, in my opinion, right? Uh, so that was a mistake. Uh, you need to know your level first before because I gave when I gave myself five months for preparation IELTS preparation my level was already very good mm -hmm. it was six six point five right but when you have students that come up to you and I had that experience one time <laughs> uh, some student came to our center and they said well my level is now this uh, and I need a 7.5 next month <laughs> so I was like, well, this person doesn't need a teacher, they need a Santa Claus, right? <laughs> <laughs> Santa Claus, uh, you know, uh, because this is a wishy-washy dream, because yeah. yes, you need to give yourself reasonable amount of time for preparation, but just don't make it, don't, don't leave it vague. Yeah, yeah. Don't leave it Absolutely. unclear. And that's an issue. I mean, I ha I'm actually this year <laughs> finally have registered and applying for the third time. And the thing which pushed me back were kind of reasonable reasons, but I was all of these were excuses. I mean, I have now, I'm a person, last time I passed, I had no children. I mean, I was just, a, I mean, I had so much free time. And now I have got two kids. I was like, Tell, like showing them as an excuse not to prepare like and I had no time I need to look after them like and but if you will really want right there's a very good saying in English like if there is a will there's a way and and finally I found a way and I started recently repairing and hopefully we'll get it done but I you know you know looking at this last two three years the last time I passed I almost didn't do anything and because of this like because of not being uh, specific because of not being right clear in my goals that when I should I because there was no deadline and we, as you said we are naturally procrastinators if we don't have a deadline or clear goals it doesn't push us so I, I, I will recommend you the same thing to all of them like you know to have the clear deadline to and also prepare earlier not like in the last moment the last year right just uh, like last six months but maybe start your language process just a year, two years earlier and like well, there's actually by one Chinese um, philosopher said like you know you have to prepare for the war not when it starts but before it starts like so you know what it takes like for emergencies I mean emergency situations all of it right and here is one thing I, I was uh, I like I was like again scrolling your like let's say channel I also big uh, SK right I was a seeker of knowledge I, I believe right I assume and and there was a thing that you seem to have opened it like actually earlier, but the first post was there on September 6, 2020. So I don't want I would like to ask what was the reason to open a channel and why it was called uh, Ozot Beg uh, Seka, right? Let's say SK. Well, thanks for the question. This is a free plug. Follow my channel, right? <laughs> on yeah. Telegram. Yeah. <laughs> when you follow him, he great, uh, shares great content. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, to be honest, I did have channels before that. Uh, Azad Bek SK is my third attempt. Ah. So, uh, as we were saying before the interview, you have to learn to, to spill before you spin, right? Mm -hmm. When you are cooking an egg and you want to spin, <laughs> necessarily you will spill <laughs> exactly. before that comes, right? And uh, Azad Bek SK means, like you said, seeker of knowledge. It's because of my major. Uh, I study at International Islamic Academy and my major is Islamic Studies. So IELTS is like my side hustle, right? Yeah. 
it's not the main thing. Uh, I would like to uh, embark on that journey of seeking knowledge and I want that to become uh, the mindset of many others, right? So seeking, because knowledge, like our great ancestor, Imam Bukhari said, yeah. there is no hope except in knowledge, yeah. right? So seeking knowledge should be the priority of every one of us, yeah. right? And that's why, and I think it's having some kind of trickling effect. I'm starting to see more and more people change their names to, so for example, if it's uh, Zalala, then they will write Zalala underscore SK. Mm -hmm. If it's, for example, uh, Ahmad Beg, they will write Ahmad Beg underscore SK. Yeah. To have that association, right? Yeah. Great. At least you have that association with knowledge, right? You learn, learn, learn. Like, uh, I think that uh, that's why, that's how it all starts. And I think it's a blessing, yeah, to see some people that you have had some sort of influence, right? And they are now in the, on the, like, let's say, I mean, in the pursuit of this knowledge. It does make you feel great, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I also realize that in another channel of yours, Iman Boosters, or we say um, the Reminders underscore SK, was opened also in autumn, like in fall, <laughs> October 21 of 2021. was a beautiful day. I mean, is that, uh, the, I mean, the season, this season that gives you some sort of motivation because it was the second channel which opened in the same season. And what's the next channel for this <laughs> autumn? No, I actually have other channels as well. My failed <laughs> attempt was uh, Seri Cardinal, which yeah. is a channel I run. I, I, I'm trying to run in Uzbek. Honestly, Uzbek is not my strongest word, like, especially the spelling, you know? Yeah. How do you write? How do you, it's, it's, it's a headache to learn <laughs> the difference between Yumshakh and Katkh, right? <laughs> so I wanted to work on that particularly, right? But uh, look, you have to compare, like, compare, ton, okay, this, this is a very difficult verb, uh, compartmentalize, yeah. I think, to where if you have one big channel, mm. it needs to have some sort of niche. Yeah. You can't be sending everything there, right? It can't yeah. be your personal diary where you start with good morning, dear subscribers, <laughs> and you end good night, <laughs> good tomorrow, right? Yeah. And it can't also be a mixture of you know, everything from IELTS to Arabic and to your personal thoughts. Yeah. And that's why I had to make that... Uh, Separate, right, channel, yes. yeah. I think, yeah, you did a good job of like, let's say, uh, I mean, making this separate channel, I mean, because it's, it completely serves a different purpose. And actually, I think you mentioned that it is actually your favorite one yes. in Telegram platform. And uh, cute on that. And what about the like speaking of the social media like who are the three people that you follow uh right in terms of let's say as a role model right and i mean i know the names but i want you to tell me why uh are these people right that you follow like well first things first i'm not a particular user of i'm not a frequent user of social media mm -hmm. and um, until recently i didn't even have an instagram account I do have a Facebook account, but it's also not very... It's like, I have it for applying to different scholarships and oh. programs because they will ask a yeah. link for your social media, right? Yeah, yeah. So I neither... I don't use Facebook very often, nor do I use Instagram until recently mm. where, uh, you know, some things have changed and now I'm thinking about <laughs> uh, using these platforms as well for spreading uh, my ideas and knowledge, right? <clears throat> but. In terms of following people, I think that number one person is. Uh, are you implying at him, Dr. Omar Sulaiman? Say, and also there was another one. Uh, use, uh, with the white stars, you should. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, these two people. I mean, of course, we definitely follow our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But other than that, right? I mean, the, on YouTube channel, like I, I see some of, a lot of the content, useful quality, high quality content that you share. And uh, so, uh, when did you start, let's say, following him and how did you find out, I mean, his channel? Uh, so, let's talk about that. Well, I feel that you need to follow someone who you benefit from, okay? Mm. Uh, so, and also your field. Does that person help you with your profession? Does that person help you with your studies, right? Because the painful issue of following celebrities, TV stars and uh, sports people who are, you're not gaining anything from them, mm, right? Yeah. 
And unfortunately, lots of us are obsessed with, you know, studying the lives of people who are, you know, celebrities without any real achievement. Exactly. And yeah. by real achievement, I don't mean to, you know, undermine their training and years mm. of practice. No. But in terms of contributing to society, right? So Omar Sulaiman is an Islamic scholar, right? Who graduated, mm. for example, the International Islamic University of uh, Malaysia, mm. right? And this is my field. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I want to have a role model, and I think all of us have need yeah. to have a role model who we could trust, first of all. Yeah. We trust their credibility. Right? Yeah. Are they a good person to follow? And then also, to learn something from them, to avoid the mistakes that I may make in the future, right? So for example, uh, they will make certain recommendations and they will sometimes warn against certain things, mm. right? So uh, that's why I, and I've been following them for quite a while now, for quite a while, to the point where mm. a lot of my subscribers, this is not a one-off occasion, this is not a one-off comment, but many people will say, you sound like Omar Sulaiman. <laughs> I think it's, you know, uh, somehow like true because I remember in my lessons also, I mean, I used to uh, watch Chris Bell's IELTSAdvantage.com and I mean, he definitely shared some great advice and I, I think he played a great role in my in progress and success in benign and listening reading and I used to speak like him or like like Pauline Collins the same way because I used to read and listen to a lot of their content and I think it's somehow, you know, when you follow this person, it, all you start to sound similar, <laughs> right? Your, your gestures, right? Yeah, you speak, <laughs> exactly. Right? So that's why uh, that, and coming to your question, just to quickly finish it up, there are three people I greatly admire uh, and I follow them on social media. Uh, so uh, alongside Omar Sulaiman, our local uh, scholar, Mubashir Ahmad, mm -hmm, who's yeah. The only Telegram channel I follow, mm. honestly, <laughs> I greatly admire his uh, mannerisms and his knowledge. And then there is Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Right. Jordan Peterson is a new person to me in my life. I think I met him. I didn't meet him uh, physically, but I stumbled upon his lectures a couple of months ago. He's a great uh, psychologist and one of the most renowned psychologists in the world yeah. at this point. Uh, so these days. Uh, and his lectures are greatly benefiting my life spiritually and emotionally. Yeah. The way he speaks is very articulate. Yeah. And he's a real psychologist. Like, <laughs> I need to mention this. This is a little bit off topic, but a lot of people like to describe themselves as psychologists. Yeah. Despite having zero credentials in that field, not <laughs> graduating any university, not doing any courses, yeah. this person uh, has studied for decades. So when he tells you that to change the world, you need to start by cleaning up your room. Yeah. He knows what he's saying. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, I definitely recommend people to check out. I definitely recommend checking out uh, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, I mean, he's a great, uh, yeah, definitely. And on, on this saying, before we move on to something else, I sometimes, you know, hear comments like people saying, I mean, you cannot read this book or you cannot follow this person because like, let's say he's not a Muslim or whatever. And I somehow uh, say, tell them, I mean, it's my opinion that, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I know he may not be a Muslim, but I mean, I'm not like, you know, following him or like, like eating what he does or, you know, like that pork or whatever, like, uh, which is, I mean, forbidden in Islam. I'm just trying to take some advantage, knowledge, good, and use it because, you know, uh, now to, let's say, prosper and thrive, even our religion and to make, right, to benefit our society, I believe we should not just study I mean, Islamic religious books, but we should also like, you know, study thoroughly the Western and just get a bit advantage of it and just, you know, help it to, how can I say, just to society, right? I mean, it's not, we should not limit ourselves. I think that there should be diversity. There should be uh, this, I mean, I think we should, yeah, I mean, there are certain things we cannot accept, whatever happens. Like, I mean, there, we know that it's totally against our beliefs and thoughts, but there are certain things like in terms of knowledge, right? Like wisdom, we can take it, and right benefit i mean if it benefits our people why not uh, what is what's your take on that i mean should we like i mean if there's let's say even the book like rich dad poor dad like sometimes he said no we should not do it like it's uh, simply like because there's a yeah there's a point of like investing and doing this riba and stuff like that but i'm not like you know i'm going i didn't like 
start doing it after following his advice. I just took away some of the key points, like the book also as well, four hour week. I have read it as well. Like, I mean, there are certain key, I think, elements in each good book, right? You can take and apply into your life. What's your take on that? Should we stop all together or is it okay if we take the things which is acceptable and usefully into our life? Like, it's a very great, it's a great question. Um, one of the narrations, prophetic narration says that wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Mm. Wherever he finds it, he picks it up, yeah. right? Uh, and if you find wisdom in non-religious texts, then why not pick it up? And it's funny you should mention this particular uh, topic because uh, I had an interesting argument back and forth with one of my teachers, who uh, not just me, but uh, now, Mm. Hundreds of thousands of Uzbeks consider him as his uh, as their role model. Uh, we had a discussion about a book written by an atheist, uh, mm. a famous, very famous writer, uh, and I just loved reading that book. Mm -hmm. it, honestly, it was one of the greatest books I ever read in my life because it was eye-opening. Mm. And the book is called Twenty First Lessons for the Twenty First Century. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So it came uh, really as an eye opener to me, but that my teacher was warning badly, like uh, vociferously against reading that book. Yeah, the author because yeah, it was because of the, yeah. because the author is not straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. His sexual orientation uh, yeah. is not appropriate, right? Uh, but look, I gained so much insight mm. from reading that book in particular, right? Mm. But Yes, there are, I think, genuine concerns. If all, if you're only reading, yeah, Western like literature, yeah. yeah, then there is a good chance that you are being brain brainwashed. <laughs> exactly. To a point where uh, evil morals, like you know, moral evils, I'm sorry, yeah. become normal to you. They, they they tend to normalize that. Yeah. So that person who wrote the book Twenty First Lessons for the Twenty First Century, I don't want to name him. Uh, but you could read the book, it's, it's, a, it's a great read. Uh, so he talks about his husband, for example. My husband told me this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, wait, you have a husband? <laughs> right? Uh, so be cautious, right? Make sure you read our Uzbek literature as well. Uh, genuine uh, spiritual books, right? Don't limit yourself to Western literature. But if there is goodness, there is goodness. Yeah. Um, speaking of books, uh, like you said, like you had, for example, some issues in writing Uzbek language. I felt the same thing you know, like some years ago and I realized that I stopped reading Uzbek literature and I actually started reading books of Utkar Hashimov, Said Ahmad and actually after reading like five, six books, I have become really good at Uzbek language and start writing good posts. And I think the thing is that uh, for me personally, I believe, uh, I mean, it's not because I'm Uzbek, the Uzbek literature is the best because I really feel those emotions and everything inside and I just, uh, I, I think it's second to none. And speaking of like in the books, I mean, our, let's say religion, yeah, it is the best way to learn about our, let's say, religion or our, let's say, uh, concept is our books. Like it's uh, that books of Bukhari, as you said, or Shaykh Muhammad, or Muhammad Yusuf, right? But the thing, I mean, like when when it comes to let's say time management or whatever, it like it could be like atomic habits or like you know some other books like productivity. Uh, yeah, everything has actually been written already in our religion. It's just that just to you know just to make it keep that diversity, right? And to learn only the useful things. I think it's okay to learn. And uh, like again, speaking of social network, you said that you use not frequently. And I am also the type of person who deactivated all of my accounts when I was preparing for IELTS. And what do you advise for people like, uh, because we have seen nowadays our phones allow us to see how often we pick up our phone, how often, right, how much time do we spend on a daily basis. Like, and there are people, young people, like spending seven, eight hours. And it's not to like watch useful content as we think. I spend also five hours to be honest, but I like most of them spends like two, three hours because I have channels and I work, but I like, like spend for something useful. So what is your advice on people who, so that they can spend time on social network less time and more in real life maybe or more on useful stuff? All right. Uh, well, the first step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. Firstly, admit to yourself that you're a social media addict 
And stop checking your phone. Nobody <laughs> misses you. <laughs> yeah. Stop checking your phone. Nobody misses you. Uh, well, I read, I did a short one minute video about that. Uh, it turns out we spend on average two hours on social media, and two hours is one tenth of our lives. Right? That's a statistically significant portion of our day, right? And uh, if you don't want to waste your life, because if you're wasting one tenth of your day, you're wasting one tenth of your life. You need to yeah. start making changes to your daily routine. And I want to mention a quick story. Uh, one time, there was a mother who came complaining to uh, to a tabib. To do you say that in English? Like a, you could say probably a doctor, right? <laughs> we don't know. It's not a doctor. <laughs> yeah, it's not a doctor. But tabib is probably you could say uh, what is like. Uh, what was that in Chinese? They also use this word like, I mean, there's a medicine, right? Um, let's say it like sort of some sort of national medicine or like, or old. Yeah, we understood. I think it's the okay, audience yes. here is really <laughs> like understand what is Tabib. So my English fails me here. <laughs> it's I actually it failed me as well. <laughs> so uh, the mother came to that Tabib and she said, look, my son is eating too much honey, right? And uh, can you advise? Can you advise him? So the Tabib goes, come to me after 40 days, right? Mm -hmm. Come to me after 40 days. So 40 days go by and the mother returns with her child. So the Tabib uh, tells this child, son, don't eat honey. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and that was all his advice. <laughs> so the mother wonders, wait, for this we had to wait 40 days? What's up with you? And then he goes explaining, look, that day when you came, I ate honey, uh -huh. right? So I couldn't advise your child against eating honey because of my own, <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. I, I did have honey myself. Yeah. So if you are asking me how to cook social media, I'm having problems with that as well. I feel that we need to pay special extra attention to the beginning of our day mm. as well as its ending. Yeah. Because a good ending, a good beginning is half the battle. Yeah. Don't check your social media accounts as soon as you open your eyes. Yeah. Right. Very good advice. That's a very you good. You don't start your day with social media accounts yeah. and you don't end your day with social media accounts. Yeah. Right? And it also helps so and it also helps to busy yourself with some more productive stuff. Go take up a course, right? Uh, start doing sports and make sure your schedule is not empty, right? Yeah. And I think some we have some apps as well that block you, your phone. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I actually set a limit on my screen time, everything. And I, in one of the books I have read myself, Atomic Habits, uh, there was a mention that if you make that bad habit invisible, uh, you don't do it anymore. If you make a good habit visible, like, you know, imagine you have a book just next to your room. Every day you see it, you somehow so, sort of feel that responsibility or blame that you're not reading that book. Because every time you see it, right, or like you, even in your like wallpaper on your phone, if you have like sort of like physique or doing a gym, it some sort of somehow motivates you right to do that workout but uh, and that's that was the key like just to put a drink glass of water next to your bed and put the phone and I think it's so important that nowadays as uh, the first thing we reach out in the morning it's unfortunately for most people it's phones and the last thing we put it again is also our phones and I in my uh, let's say you know preparation I as I said I, that was the only battle now I had to conquer and I sank Thanks God, I conquered it. I stopped using accounts, deactivated them, and I felt so much productive. Like we, we, you know, we. I mean, I, I'm all actually old enough to remember the times when we didn't have phones, and we used to spend it so much differently. I mean, when you didn't have this social media or phone or games, and I think the one way is to to make that happen. I actually myself am um, an addictive uh, person, like I have this addictive behavior, whatever I started, it could be games or social media, I am really into it. So one way I really, let's say, overcome this was I deleted it, so it was, I had to install, let's say, to play that game or to use that social network, I had to install it again, so it would take me 15 minutes, so I made this process difficult. And it made me to use it less. And the, the thing with good habits, I start actually to reward myself. Like I would read a book and I would choose an easy, simple book. And every time I finish a book, I would just reward and buy something for myself. 
It was, I think, it was some of the, you see, again, some of the lessons which I learned from sort of Western book, but I think we could apply to our life and, right, be more productive. Speaking of books, uh, you seem to have recommend, let's say, <laughs> I may be a little bit criticizing here, you seem to have encouraging to watch movies more than reading books. Uh, why is that? Uh, no, no, that's... <laughs> <laughs> because in one of your posts, maybe after you read that, who will cry when you die, <laughs> you somehow posted that thing. Maybe it's because that book is simple and basic, or is it... No, no, don't, <laughs> don't <laughs> misinterpret my <laughs> suggestion. Uh, like, reading books is great, okay? But there are certain things I would like people to understand. Mm -hmm. Reading books by itself doesn't make you a better person, yeah. okay? Because uh, there is something called action faking. Yeah. Action faking is when you think you're improving your life, when you think you're being productive, but you're in reality procrastinating, mm -hmm. right? I have met people who would read a couple of books a week, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I mean, from a side, you say, well, that's a great person. Yeah. I mean, society has uh, made reading books into something heavenly to yeah. if you if i tell you now imagine <laughs> an exemplary girl or picture to in your mind a, a good boy necessarily a book will pop up in yeah his hands, <laughs> right but not all the books are great first and foremost. yeah secondly even if you read great books if you don't apply into practice yeah. what you have read yeah. then it's useless and one of the, like, it's an interesting analogy. I'm a big fan of reading books, mm. right? I, I do consider myself a bookworm. Mm. Uh, and I, we have lots of books at home, but now I'm having a book anxiety from stockpile of unread books. There have been generations, not one generation, two or three generations that didn't read any books altogether, except one or two. Mm. But these were the greatest generations of all time. Why? Because knowledge is only useful when you put it into practice. Sofian Athauri, he has a great saying, right? That uh, knowledge in combination, like knowledge and action should go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's also another quote I uh, actually learned from someone. Uh, reading uh, without reflecting, it's like eating without digesting. <laughs> You know, like you eat, but if you don't digest, what happens? Like you don't, right? Exactly. Get that energy. Like when it comes to reading books, my general principle is that it's not necessarily something praiseworthy unless it's followed by some kind of action, yeah. some kind of change. If you read a book about productivity, yeah. but you're still unproductive, yeah. don't go to the second book, right? Because, yeah. and if you have a bunch of tasks, Incomplete, incomplete, which you need to address. Yeah. But you turn to your book, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is action faking. Yeah. You need to get your act together. If you're preparing for IELTS, then put away that Russian literature, right? Anna yeah, Karina, yeah. put put that away. <laughs> yeah. Focus on your IELTS. Exactly. Don't lie to yourself that you're reading books and that in and of itself is improving your life. That was the point of my post. Mm -hmm. Who will cry when you die? I didn't like this book at all. It was too simple. Yeah, for, yeah. for me, it was too simple. Yeah. But <laughs> I'd rather watch a movie, which like mm -hmm. something like In Pursuit of Happiness, yeah, yeah, Freedom right. Riders, right? Yeah, yeah very great. It, this will click. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, speaking of reading books, I myself, I mean, uh, started reading books actually uh, actively, like proactively myself, like uh, just going to a library and at the age of 25 actually. Even though late, I'm really still thankful because I just, I mean, it has transformed the way I live. Because as you said, I try to apply the knowledge uh, in my life. I mean, I was having a problem with time. I've read a couple of books on time management and I just followed. It was so hard to change and get out of that comfort zone but I when I finally did it it was worth it 
and the same with the, like even financials like I mean I read some books on finance and just managed it and uh, before I was making just making ends meet so like barely and I ended up being very let's say financially let's say freedom right I mean financial freeze and that was the key I think and there was another problem me like trying to read a book every week and when I tried this experiment because I saw one video like 52 books in 52 weeks and I tried it but I felt like after three books uh, I was yeah reading books but it was just a number I wasn't like getting that wisdom or knowledge right or real progress in my life and I decided to go back to my old style yeah I'm, instead I'm gonna change style okay I'm gonna read let's say a 30 minutes a day or one hour a day uh, but because some books we know right is they are like they are like I don't know like they're not light reading I mean it's a hard you need to spend some time analyze what is there actually but some books are really di digest so I think you're totally right when you said we need to write apply the knowledge other than if not I mean what's the point of reading books or what's the point of having it right if you don't apply what you like actually in one of your puzzles you mentioned the knowledge is what benefits not it's what's learned only right uh, and speaking of again books what's your most favorite uh, book or three books in English language that you would recommend to people that they read okay like the moment I came here uh, <laughs> the book I saw was 451 degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> okay uh, I will recommend three books uh, 451 degrees Fahrenheit is my favorite uh, novel mm -hmm. okay uh, so I like reading novels as well I'm not I don't have much time for that now uh, but I mean a lot of people these days they are reading 1984 by George Orwell yeah right mm. 1984 is also a great book there are other books like we or uh, Oh Brave New World 451 degrees Fahrenheit is a great novel by Ray Bradbury one of my favorite authors his other books are also great and in it he describes a world where books are a crime mm. interesting right? Just to the point, uh, <laughs> on topic. <laughs> yeah. If they find the book in your house, yeah. they're gonna burn down your house. Interesting. In total. Yeah. Right? I have to read. I have to read this book then. <laughs> so it's it's a mind shift. It's a paradigm shifting book. After which you will start. You will definitely start appreciating books, right? Yeah. And they say. I mean, I, I get emotional when I think about this because I read it three times. You know, mm -hmm. with notes. Uh, they, they, they have a beautiful quote uh, at the end uh, that burning books is a crime mm. but a bigger crime is not reading them at all yeah right wow. so this right. is the book uh, in terms of novels in terms of self-help productivity books my uh, I used to like a book by Randy Gage called why you are sick dumb and broke mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, it was also very <laughs> thought-provoking <laughs> yeah. in how to become, you know, yeah. wealthy and, and stuff, you know. Uh, it's a light read. I'm not going to recommend it now because uh, I changed it uh, to Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective yeah, People. very good book. A bit, uh, maybe it's inaccessible to an average, respect to a beginner reader because mm. it's uh, not small. Yeah, yeah. However, it's pretty comprehensive. Yeah. And <clears throat> if you apply these habits to your life, putting first things first, you know, uh, being proactive, beginning with the end in mind. These are all cool suggestions uh, for self-help books. And my, uh, you know, spiritual book, uh, I don't like to use uh, the word spiritual, religious books, is uh, Gardens of the Righteous by Imam al nawawi uh, May Allah have mercy on him. Imam al nawawi is one of the greatest scholars our Ummah has produced. And, all of his books are great. Uh, Imam al nawawis Gardens of the Righteous in Uzbek, that's uh, Riyaz al Salihin. You can find it in our Charsu uh, book, bookshops. But it costs a little expensive, uh, mm. close to 200,000 so. <laughs> But you're not gonna regret think, it. <laughs> yeah, it's probably worth it, yeah. I mean, yes, because it's, you... it's a collection of prophetic narrations mm -hmm. in topics, like divided into topics, yeah. made accessible to an average layman, okay? It's yeah. not, some people say, well, uh, how about Bukhari's collections of uh, narrations? Well, how, upon our heads, you know, <laughs> but they are not, they, sometimes they are not accessible to an average person, right? Yeah. So I try Riyadh al-Salihin. Don't read the whole book from cover to cover at first in one go. 
take it slowly, yeah. right? Every day, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, yeah, yeah. and just feel the book, you know, yeah, connect yeah. to the Sunnah. <laughs> and I think these three books are my top recommendations. Good recommendations. I guess I'm going to look after them after this interview. And uh, speaking of, again, these books and stuff, I want to also uh, some sort of get your insight into your life. You know, although you are quite young, you already have some experience and about, you know, how to live, how to read. And and we, I think we all have had that moment, like where it was a like click uh, and that we become from that lazy, responsible, young, right immature person to someone who is proactive who now cares about his future or family or society so when I mean if you can remember when was that moment and why it happened the way it happened also an interesting question you're totally right uh, though I'm not a great person now <laughs> I used to be much worse <laughs> back in the school days uh, and I remember playing truant uh, skipping school classes for playing computer games, you know. Yeah. I was a computer game addict. Uh, there is a game called Dota, uh, Dota yeah. 1, not Dota 2. I hate Dota 2. Warcraft. Uh, <laughs> I used to spend my day in computer clubs yeah. at the expense of my studies and everything, you know. And that was uh, probably the lowest moment in my life uh, back in 2012, 2011. Uh, though, Despite being addicted to computer games, I did. I was successful uh, academically. You know, I was very good at math. I participated in math competitions. I was the chess champion uh, of Andijan back in the school days. <clears throat> I think the clicking moment was when I started learning English, because mm. I really found my passion in learning languages. Okay, it's I start. By the way, uh, apart from English and Arabic, I also tried learning French and Korean, uh, though I had to stop for some reasons, you know. Uh, th that moment was when I started learning English. In September 2014, I clearly remember that. The moment I started learning English, uh, my life changed entirely because I really gave my all in. And mm. I think this is, uh, this is why you, ha you need to find your niche, your passion. If you had all the time in the world, if you had all the money in the world, what would you busy yourself with, right? And if you can find that one thing that really makes you feel alive, because most people are just baying, like, you know, <laughs> there is a difference between baying and living, yeah, yeah. existing and living. Yeah. If you can find that thing that makes you feel alive, I'm pretty sure it's going to change your life. Uh, but once again, I'm trying to work on myself. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a it's never an ending journey, process. right? Endless journey of getting better than you were yesterday. And I think, uh, on, I mean, speaking of this, I also, I mean, I, I mean, if I look at it, I said I started actually really late. I mean, uh, at the age of 25, it was a real shift happened. And um, sometimes I, yeah, also like saying and regret, I mean, what, I mean, why I wasted like, uh, I mean, so much time, but I also sometimes then I start to feel thankful because what if I didn't change even at all? Like, it's, 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 I mean, I have to be right at, after all thankful that at least, I mean, I have changes, the mindset, the same, and it's, I mean, it's I think never late, right? Like, Better late than never. Yeah, exactly. Better so late than never. for all of you who are watching, if you think that it's still late for you to change, I think it's never late and it's about not comparing. I mean, oftentimes we compare ourselves to someone who is better, younger, smarter, but we don't know what the circumstances were they, right? In, in their early, maybe they had a very good parent or like, or some friends or surrounding atmosphere, right? Which shaped this person and personality, but uh, maybe you had that harsh reality. So I think maybe your story would be even more end up, right? Getting better. So the thing is, yeah. And speaking of this life and inspiration, like in your life, I mean, is there certainly, right? I mean, your parents should, I mean, must have played probably a great role, right? In maybe getting you that in English courses or how would you think, what is the role, uh, I mean, of your parents in the person who you have become now? Indispensable. Uh, I, I want to take this chance to thank my parents, uh, my mom and my dad. My mom is an English teacher at university and uh, she sponsored all of my studies uh, when I was just beginning to learn English back in 2014. My mom used to pay for my courses 
And after I took IELTS, you know, uh, only then did she yeah. stop financing uh, me, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was uh, with her help that, not just with money monetarily, but also with sources. I, the first book I read was, uh, I, I forgot the name because it was seven mm. years ago, but from her bookshelf, you know. Yeah. I, I used her dictionaries, there was this brown, dic we used book dictionaries, yeah, you know. Yeah, in the past, exactly. <laughs> Nowadays people don't use it. Dinos are the time, you know. <laughs> they think it's botanic. <laughs> <laughs> no. And my father, who uh, paid for my IELTS, okay, yeah. which also used to cost just 400,000 songs back in the day, you know. Uh, so they were really the, they, they, they take the lion's share of my IELTS and knowledge of English as a whole, because they sponsored and they helped me. Uh, and waivers, like, uh, you know, when you have home chores, uh, your parents are going to say, well, let him do his homework and stuff. Yeah. Right? So that also helps, I yeah. think. Yeah, so sacrifice himself to, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can have a better life. And uh, speaking of again life, what advice would you give to someone who, you know, who is at your age or younger, like to your peers, like uh, like right now? I mean, you know, just some of the just general or maybe specific suggestions so that they can also, you know, start that or make that shift happen. Right, uh, once again, not in the position to, <laughs> to give life We're not old enough <laughs> to give life-changing advice. <laughs> but we did start an interesting series on my channel called How to Live a Miserable Life. Oh. Right? How to Live a Miserable Life, part one, part two. Yeah. We already did that. Uh, because uh, I think that to start improving your life, first, uh, first of all, you need to start ruining it. Yeah. Right? And... Uh, there was a person who was very skilled at making uh, objects, you know, uh, hand, handicraft. Handcra yeah, handcraft, yes, handcraft. And they asked him, how do you make such beautiful elephants? Yeah. How do you make such beautiful elephants? And he said, well, all I do is I take away the parts which don't look like an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very. <Right? laughs> so if you want to start improving your life, I would recommend uh, that you stop ruining it, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of wasting your time, you know, in terms of hanging out with bad company, because company also plays a, a, a big part. Uh, a prophetic narration, our Prophet Sallallahu said that uh, you are on the religion of your close friend. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That you mentioned actually in one of your videos, like showing four students who got IELTS eight oral and yours the average of five people you interact a lot. Yeah. And I think it's totally true, you know, I cannot agree more. Right. And from there you start improving. So first you need to take away the bad things and then there is this vacuum which you have to fill with goodness, right? So uh, the same advice, just find your passion and work uh, hard right yeah. day in day night day in day out right just hustle right mm. grind uh, and i think that should help and maybe in the future i will give better advice <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, as someone let's say let's say maybe somehow <laughs> have a, a more life experience i mean i had friends i mean school friends uh, we now have become totally different in terms of how we think uh, life how we think the goals i mean what's the success and for them, is, the life is now, I, I mean, as far as it seems, it's mostly about having fun. I mean, just uh, having that car and house ready and just uh, after getting married, just, you know, just doing fun, chokhana, whatever. It's just typical average Uzbek life. And they, they let alone to improve them, they don't think about how they can contribute to society. And, and for that reason, uh, I somehow actually that you know not in that circle anymore yeah I still keep communication like say hello and just bye you know just how to, how they are in general but we're not that close anymore I feel and I actually feel leaner towards like true friends that we and we know that true friends could be only one and two people and uh, like as you said you cannot I don't know lead, lead a healthy lifestyle if you are among people who smoke or who drink right who just care about that uh, fun Yes, company is very important and if I could just <coughs> add something there, one of my uh, huge, and I would say someone I truly admire from our uh, scholars in the past is Abul Farraq uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, who is 
the most prolific writer in Islamic tradition, who wrote hundreds and hundreds of volumes of books, more than anybody else, right, before him. Uh, he has a couple of beautiful sayings. He was very, very conscious of how he used his time, mm -hmm. to a point where he would prepare some pencils and some other menial chores. Why? Mm -hmm. So that when people come asking for his advice, he can talk to them and at the same time sharpen <laughs> his pencils, right? Yeah. To make the best use of his son. He mentions a beautiful saying. He says, if it was possible for a person to ascend to the highest heaven, mm -hmm. it would be considered a grotesque deficiency to be content with living on earth. So mm -hmm. you really have to put your raise the bar, right? Make your mm -hmm. standards as, as high as possible. Even if you don't achieve them, then like shoot for the stars, you will aim for the stars, yeah. you shoot the moon, right? Exactly. It, it, if it was possible, and he says that, Ibn Jawzi says, if it was possible for you to pass by all the scholars, then do so. Yeah. Because they were human and yeah. you were human. The person you are looking up to now, a living person, right, that um, scholar with, you know, a million, millions of followers or that celebrity, uh, that whoever, you know, they are, they also started somewhere right? yeah i mean everything i mean all these journeys has started with the first step exactly. the person you are seeing on the top of the mountain yeah he was not born on yeah. top of that mountain exactly you have to make the climb yeah and it's this advice definitely can be applied into islands itself like you know like you just need to start and just do it every day and speaking of this i mean i couldn't i think uh let's say somehow you know did this interview without mentioning that big event happened in 2020, like this pandemic whole stuff, which ultimately changed many people's life. How it changed your life? I mean, what was the impact like? Uh, and I don't know, what are your key lessons that you took from this uh, right pandemic stuff? For me, <clears throat> pandemics was uh, particularly painful uh, because it's actually started slightly before the pandemic. Mm. Okay. But this is going to be a drawn out answer. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I didn't. I mean, we need to face the reality, so let's. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention this. Uh, I think uh, I, I did mention this topic in passing, but not in great, great detail. So before the pandemic, say in January 2020, hmm. I was living a dream life. Hmm. I was a student at my at a great university. Yeah. I had job, okay. Uh, my everything was going yeah. very, very smoothly. Yeah. Really, there was no reason to complain. Yeah. <laughs> but then on, I remember that day on Friday, uh, my chest started hurting. Mm -hmm. I had a, a pain in the chest. Closer to the evening, I thought to myself, "Well, I think it's gonna go away if I just mm. maybe it's because of lack of sleep, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. I had that in the past as well." But, you know, I took, so I, I slept uh, at night and I woke up before Fajr prayer. The pain didn't go away. Uh. In fact, it became excruciating. You know? <laughs> it was uh, intolerable, yeah. right? So I had to go. We had an emergency uh, heart car cardio center near our yeah. house. They checked everything. My heart, I didn't have, I, I thought I was having heart attack mm, yeah, okay? yeah. because of that pain yeah. here. It was hard for me to even walk, let alone mm. like uh, breathing and things of that sort. So I thought to myself, maybe this is the end. <laughs> 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 you know, my life's coming to an end. But then we went to the, to check my lungs. I yeah. was all doing it by myself because my family is in Andijan. Yeah, yeah. And I don't have many uh, family members here in Tashkent except for my aunt who, who did help me a lot. Uh, so they checked my lungs and it turns out I had a, something called uh, pneumothorax mm. which is a condition where your lung collapses mm. from air pressure, right? So my right uh, lung collapsed and there was a lot of air yeah. there which we had to uh, release. You squeeze, know? yeah? Squeeze yes. out. Yeah. So on, on the spot, the doctor who checked me, he drilled a hole in my right, 
right lung. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, such... so I, and then the air did come out. Yeah. I, I felt a relief. Uh, but it was just all the beginning, mm -hmm. you know. For two months, I was hospitalized. Uh, it turns out I had some kind of uh, parasite in my lung. Echina uh, Koch, I think. Yeah. I no need to mention that yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> by yeah. name, but I, was, I had an operation, surgery on my right lung. Uh, and it, it is all happening in February. Like yeah. February slash January. Yeah, right? yeah. The pandemic is just starting out yeah. in, in the world and it became official. Yeah, I think it was on March 17th. University classes get closed now. So I'm already in the hospital. Yeah. Right? Now everybody's at home. <laughs> and the saddest part thing, not the sad, but the most problematic part was that my family weren't allowed to visit me. Mm. Right? Yeah. So I'm there all alone. Everything was blocked, right? Yeah. Right? In the hospital. And look, uh, compare that to how I started. I was living a dream life. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm in hospital. <laughs> life turned upside down. I had a surgery on my right lung. My family can't visit me. It's pandemics all over the place, you know? And uh, I ran out of savings. Now I'm in, I'm in debt. My yeah. father has to pay the tuition fee, right? Mm -hmm. So from living a dream life, now I'm in a position where I can't even pray properly. I mm -hmm. had to pray lying down, you know. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't fast that year at all yeah. because because of yeah. my illness, right? It wouldn't allow you. So the things that, alhamdulillah, now everything is back normal, you know. The lessons I learned was, first of all, is you have to always be thankful yeah. for the things you have in your life, right? لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you show thanks, I will increase you, right? Yeah. Never for a moment assume or never for a moment take your blessings for granted. That job that you have, that university that you have, your health, all of these are blessings that you need to be thankful for, right? And another thing I realized was the importance of family. Before friends, I didn't mention that to my friends, except for my groupmates, they would know. Yeah. From my being absent, you know, yeah. for uh, weeks and weeks on end. My family were of crucial importance. I never felt as connected to my aunties and my parents and my brothers as in that period, right? So don't take them for granted. If possible, show how much you love them, right? Buy them, I don't know, some gifts, yeah, right? Unexpected, Just right? Just make sure you're uh, in touch with them because when everyone leaves, they're gonna stay. Yeah. When, you're, when you run out of money, they run, their money will come uh, exactly. in, to rescue you, right? When you run out of friends to emotionally support you, when you run out of neighbors to help you, you know, family is the thing that uh, I felt deeply connected to, right? So these two things, right? Always be thankful for your life and secondly, appreciate your family while they are still around. Good, very good, thoughtful advice. So let's now move on to some sort of, let's say, right, like an IELTS part three, some abstract question. What is the big goal for you? Like, I mean, in your life, if, you know, some things that you feel satisfied that you didn't live in vain, like you have may like, you know, live it a meaningful life. What could be that big goal? Okay. Well, to keep the answer as, uh, you know, you don't want a generic answer, I guess, to be a good person. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's say there could be like some, let's say, mission, right? Like, like I want to do this or yes. that. I feel like it's important to be sincere in your goals, in your life mission, right? Because there is a scary narration about the Day of Judgment where three people will be brought forth. Mm. One of them is a scholar reciter of the Quran. Right? Another person is a martyr who gave his life uh, mm -hmm. in the way of Allah. And then the third person is a generous, right? Jawad, Karim, yeah. someone who spent lots of money uh, in charity. And then they will be asked very tough questions. They are the first people brought forth uh, to the reckoning. It will be said to the reciter of the Quran, why did you learn the book of Allah, right? Why did you learn? And then he will reply, for your sake. Yeah. For your sake, oh Allah. And then uh, Allah is going to say, you're lying. 
you learn the Quran so that people would say, he's the reciter, he's the Qari. And people did say that. Yeah. Now take him to the hellfire. <laughs> The second person will be brought forth and then uh, the martyr who gave his life in yeah. the way of Allah. And it will be said to him the same thing. Why did you give your life yeah. away? Like, what, the martyr, what for? For your sake of Allah. And then Allah is going to reply, you're lying. Yeah. You did so, so that people said, this person is courageous, yeah. brave. And people did say that. Yeah. So you took your reward in the, dun the, in the dunya, yeah. now take him to the hellfire. And then the third person will be brought forth, the, the generous man, the jawad, and it will be said to them, to him, why did you give your money in charity, right? Why would you spend on the poor, yeah. right? Uh, on the fuqara, on the masakin? Uh, and then he will reply, for your sake, oh Allah. <laughs> Allah is going to reply, you're lying. You did so, so that people said, this so-and-so is generous, right? So-and-so is generous. And people did say that. Now, take him to the hellfire, right? So, the outwardly deeds can be, can, can be deceiving, right? Yeah. So, you see a great person who is doing all the great stuff, but his intention is yeah. not sincere. Yeah. The result is what? People did praise you in this dunya, now take him to the hellfire, right? Yeah. So, I think that the life goal is to make sure that your private life, yeah. not just public, is better than your public life. Mm -hmm. So anything that people are seeing of you, so they are seeing how you're doing lots of great work, you're yeah. spending lots of money in charity, you are spreading knowledge. This is in the public eye. Yeah. There is something called showing off, right? Riyadh, yeah. right? Your private life, at home you need to be a better person with your family, with your friends. When nobody sees you, integrity is doing the right thing even if nobody watches you. Yeah. That's why our Prophet ﷺ, he said, the best of you are the best to their households. Yeah. Why? Because nobody knows you as much as your, for example, spouse, yeah. as your children, right? So that's, I think that this is one of my main goals is to make sure that whatever people are seeing of me, yeah. In reality, I'm better than that. Right? Yeah. That's the, uh, the famous du'a, the best person to ever step foot on earth, uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. May Allah be pleased with him. He said that when people were praising him too much, you know, <laughs> and he deserves to be praised. Yeah. He deserves to be praised. He said, Allahumma la tu'akhidni bima yaqulun. Well, Allah, don't, uh, don't punish me for what they are saying. Yeah. Right? And forgive me what they don't know. Yeah. and make me better than they think yeah this would be my answer yeah good i think it's a cherry on the top to our today's talk thank you so much i would like to say for i think very thoughtful uh, talk uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you in person and uh, hopefully you know we hope to make right our dreams come true and help maybe hope this talk will be helpful for all the pe uh, people who are watching it uh, so if you have some final thoughts or things that maybe you uh, right you expect me to ask or not <laughs> I don't ask uh, I mean I would love to now uh, I mean uh, say it and just uh, you know finish it well thank you very much for having me here uh, it was a great pleasure to talk uh, I think an hour more than an hour passed by yeah. And uh, I hope this talk was beneficial and useful to our listeners. Uh, if there are any mistakes on my part, then uh, pardon me. Uh, well, that's pretty much it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then, thank you very much, guys. Have a good time.